I want winners. I want people that want to win. You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. You got to put your money where your mouth is, Pete. It's not gambling advice. Okay, Monday episode of Not Gambling Advice. It's April 25th. I'm Colby Olson. I'm your host. I'm joined today not by Peter Apple, but by Dusty Baker, another writer here at JustBaseball.com, another fantasy lover himself. Dusty, how you doing, my man? Yeah, you know what? It's uh, Unfortunately for the listeners here, they got really excited, and then they heard my voice. They thought it was going to be some other Dusty Baker. But, uh, yeah, it's really, really good to join in here. And, uh, you know, I've been able to do little pieces with Just Baseball for a while. And, uh, you know, let's talk fantasy baseball, Colby, because there's nothing better than doing that after week after week of looking forward to this to now this, the torture every day of who do I start, who do I sit. I mean, I think the torture too is I am in five leagues myself, man. And every single morning it is a, it is a half hour chore of making sure one that I picked up everybody that I want to pick up in, in each league, but making sure that my lineup is set, that I have 800 injuries going on at once that I have 800 pitchers that I need to take care of. It is a lot, but it's also so rewarding and fun at the same time. But this episode, we're going to get into who you should be picking up tomorrow. And we're going to go over some streaming pitchers for the week. Probably some double dippers in here might be risky, but we'll see how they go. First, I'm going to shoot it over to you. Who's your must grab of the week? Yeah, uh, and there's a lot of big names out there probably for most leagues at this point. Uh, I'm going to use standard Yahoo League percentages and under 50%. I'm going to dig deep below that 50%. Let's go talking about inside the top, actually bottom 20%. uh, And I love Josh Naylor. I think that this is a kid that has come up um, he's been given his opportunity in a lineup that actually has thrived better than most people have realized. And uh, I think the expectation there is that, you know, maybe he's not going to get all these starts, but he has over the past week and he's had multiple double digit hit games. And uh, I really like the way that the bat has shown up there. He's owned on only 6% of Yahoo leagues at this time. Um, and I think that people are starting to catch on just a little bit. How about a guy also that is owned just a little more than Naylor? That would be Taylor Ward. He was a trendy pickup late this past week. L.A. Angels, he looks like he's getting his opportunity as well in the lineup as an everyday starter, and he's delivered the most of it, too, in that middle of that order, which honestly, it should offer the opportunity for him to drive in a lot of runs, score a lot of runs. Um, It it could be a small sample size from what we've seen so far, but Taylor Ward ultimately 13% owned at this time in standard Yahoo leagues. And I will say this, he's a guy that I, I have targeted and picked up in four of my five leagues as well. And and part of the reason why, how about a 360 start heading into the day of recording? He's slugging over 500. uh, And and I just love the power and possible speed combo that he presents in a lineup where he will have that opportunity. You bring up two really interesting guys. Their first ward is hitting two through five in this Angels lineup, which is insane because they have Otani, they have a a Trout, they have Rendon, they even have, you know, Brandon Marsh, who we're going to get to later. And Ward is hitting second, third, and fourth, which is nuts. 42% hard hit rate on the year. If he's hitting in the middle of that Angels lineup, why can't you like him? But you brought up Josh Naylor, and such an interesting guy, because this guy was revered as a top prospect forever. He was going to come up and be kind of a Schwarber-type player. Big, big masher hitter. And yet he's controlling his strikeout percentage right now. He's hitting the ball 55% hard hit rate right now. He looks really good. He's saying five and six in that in that Guardians lineup could be another guy. If you're in a, you know, 12, 14, 16 team league to go get Taylor Ward could be a guy even in a 12 team league that you're looking at. I'm going to get to a guy that, you know, is not as deep of a sleeper as those two, but is a guy that I think people forget has all star capabilities when healthy. And that's just the thing that's been holding him back. It's Brennan Nemo of the Mets. He's been hitting leadoff in this Mets lineup, career high hard hit rate this year. The only thing, right, that I said is those injuries that have held him back. But if he's healthy, you can expect top run production and average. You know, I think he can put up a 280 average and he's an on base percentage machine. This could be a guy that that is a sleeper as as an all star caliber player this year. 
42% ownership in ESPN right now. I like him to go to go grab him if you especially if you're in a non-base percentage league. Yeah, I, I think that Nimmo is an on-base percentage monster, as you had mentioned. Uh, on top of that, uh, to see the fact that he's actually slugging this year, I think that's the difference. And granted, it is an early sample size, but his hard hit rate is in the top 73 percentile. Um, you know, outside of max exit velocity, and most of what you've seen from him off the bat is in the higher upper echelon of the league so far. And so uh, that's something that we were kind of missing with Brandon Nimmo in the past. Uh, he has had some injury history that has been kind of concerning, but I think a lot of people, you know, you've heard Nimmo's name for a while. He's been in this league for seven years, but he's only 29 years old. He's still very much in his prime. And I would say in a much better lineup, uh, the Mets are featuring now than in previous years. So maybe that's the reason why he's seen better pitches. Uh, and the fact that also his OPS is over 940 is just ridiculous to say that, you know, he, he used to be a guy that you would just stream and pick up for the on base percentage alone, knowing that he probably wasn't going to give you many counting stats. And while he may not offer stolen base, is the fact that he's offering the counting stats of home runs he'll give you doubles uh he's going to be able to hit for average and get on base that that's something that i think is shocking to me that people are not catching on to at this time i, I love that pickup and uh, in standard yahoo leagues he's only owned as of now by 30 percent of owners so if you're in a yahoo espn league scoop him up before people realize this kid could be the key to an easy on base percentage increase and before you move on to your next guy, I just want to touch in the, in the last 159 games, he's hitting 289 with a 403 on base percentage and a 460 slugging percentage. Good for a 145 WRC plus. I mean, that is crazy. I'm telling you, this guy has all-star potential if he stays healthy. He does. And uh, as I had mentioned previously, I, I just think that maybe the opportunity with uh, the lineup around him hasn't been nearly as great for him as it is now I think that Mets lineup has got it clicking on all cylinders there's, I mean there's a reason why currently on paper uh, they have the best record in all of baseball and production wise I mean their offense has been one of the best in the league and Nemo has contributed the people around him have contributed and as you mentioned as, as Colby is the big WRC plus master um, so is Nemo showing off right now so I think that he's an easy scoop it's almost no question to me at this time don't sit on it jump at it before it's too late absolutely man and and Another guy that I want to dive into is Brandon Marsh, who I mentioned earlier in that Angels lineup. He has a new approach this year. He's only striking out 20% of the time, 11% walk rate, both career lows and career highs. Now he's hitting five and six in that Angels lineup. He has 13 RBIs on the season, tied sixth in baseball with Seiya Suzuki. 38% line drive rate is third in baseball, matched with a 52% hard hit rate. I mean, really, man, you want to hit the ball hard. You want to hit it on the line. That's exactly what he's doing, and it's driving him to have a, an average over 300 right now. If he continues to do that and, and keep the ball at least, you know, minimize the amount of times he's putting the ball on the ground or at least maximize the line drives, I have no doubt that this guy is going to come close to 100 RBIs, probably 85, but that's super valuable with how hard he's in the ball. Yeah, no doubt about that. And also, it's shocking to me. Only 33% owned right now in Yahoo Leagues. Marsh is the kind of guy that I would say I've targeted ever since he was a young prospect. I mean, he was one of the top Angels prospects. And, and of course, he would be. First of all, let's just take a look at his build. He's six foot four. The guy is ginormous. He's 215 pounds. He's only 24 years old, by the way. So if you're in a keeper league, this is the kind of guy that you should have already had your eye on a long time ago. If he's not owned in your keeper league, you are – that. I mean, that is – that is disgraceful, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, what, what type of league are you in, right? Really? I mean, yeah, come on now. Like, like, what losers, all two teams that you're playing, you, yourself, and you. I, I mean, you got to pick this guy up. And if you're in a standard one-year league, there's really not much more of an excuse to have him as a free agent. So the fact that only 33% have owned him is borderline line mind-boggling to me I, I was shocked by that number his hard hit rate is at the 86 percentile right now in major league baseball his average exit velocity in the same spot um his expected weighted on base percentage and on on base average as well i mean they're all nearly 90 percentile right now and this is a guy that has had 45 plate appearances so it is a small sample size but you have to realize you know he his career leading up to this at least two years that's it he's a young guy 
lineup that's trending in the right direction uh, to hit in. The RBI, it's similar to kind of what I mentioned with Taylor Ward, the, the RBI presence is going to be there. And man, this guy is just a pure hitter, Colby. I got to tell you, uh, the OPS is hovering around 950 right now. That is something that already should ticker to me. This is a guy that I need to own. Um, he's been one of the trendiest players to pick up in Yahoo standard leagues, and rightfully so. You shouldn't be shocked by that. Uh, one thing that's really interesting that I don't think a lot of people realize about Brandon Marsh is not only is he going to put up great offensive numbers, but he also is one of the faster players in the league. I think that goes unnoticed sometimes because he's on a team where, you know, quite frankly, the Angels don't steal nearly as much as they used to with Mike Trout, obviously kind of being more of a power and 4 2 5 kind of guy. But he's in the sprint, sprint speed right now at the 95th percentile, which at that point you assume he's going to get you at least 10, 15 steals. Maybe it goes upward even more depending on how much he gets on base, which right now, now, that's hovering around 400. So if he's hovering around the free agent market in your league, that guy better be owned by the end of tomorrow or I will come for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think another interesting thing about the sprint speed isn't that, you know, he brings the speed on the base pass, right? 10, 15 stolen bases. But I like that that keeps him in the lineup every single day. He's going to be in center field most of the time because he's a gold glover out there. And they just want to keep him in the lineup for that. So he's not going to be benched against lefties, even though he might not be the best hitter against lefty. He's still going to be in the lineup. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the opportunity of just being able to be present with, uh, I mean, he, okay, so he is one of several lefties in that lineup. You have Jared Walsh, who they kind of will mix and match him as well in the order. Joe, Joe Madden is a guy that you just cannot predict. Obviously, you saw him in potentially walk Corey Seager at the end of the day this guy he, he kind of makes you get a bit of a headache I have Rosella Iglesias needed to save in fantasy on the Sunday uh, in order to win my matchup and uh, he decided to go with Archie Bradley after featuring Rosella Iglesias in a no save situation the day before so Joe Madden may drive you crazy but one thing that he's got to his disposal is he's got a lot of really talented hitters from one through six I would say um, you could even argue that Joe Adele uh, will be given an opportunity this year to produce and uh, provide to that lineup. But I think that Marsh is going to be a staple moving forward. I do love this this name to be picked up right now. It is a little shocking to me that more people haven't jumped on the Marsh ship right now. And so uh, I think that we're docking into the, the Marsh area, and I think it's time that we actually pull the trigger on this one and pick him up. So you, you brought up Marsh, you brought up Adele there, who we, we love on this podcast as well. Hard hit rate is through the roof. But I want to bring to you, I want, I want to ask you about a former top prospect who's finally kind of finding his stride. And I think that's a common theme this year after what we saw in 2020, guys just not getting the at-bats they needed to develop. And just kind of a weird year, even when they weren't on the field, like could they get to the facility to train? And so now two years later, we're kind of seeing guys that, that were maybe delayed in development finally shining through. And that guy's JP Crawford, who's absolutely raking right now. He's hitting 340, a 210 WRC plus. He's only striking out 4.8% of the time while walking 14% of the time. That's pretty crazy, man. That's pretty crazy. So I want to ask you, is JP Crawford a guy? It is a really deep shortstop position, but is he a guy that, that is a must get right now? And, and we see a guy like Dansby Swanson struggling. Are you grabbing, grabbing a Crawford over a Swanson right now? You know, and that's a really good comp right there because I think a lot of fantasy owners are struggling to figure out what to deal with a guy like Dansby Swanson who, quite frankly, is offering them no future value. I, I, I think that Swanson at some point will have to turn this thing around, and, and I think he will, to be honest with you. But at the time, I would say, yes, I am jumping at J.B. Crawford. It depends, of course, on the statistics your league is gunning for. If you're looking for just home run pop, if you're looking for a guy that's going to slug, J.P. Crawford's really not your guy, uh, despite the fact that early on his slugging percentage is at 574. He's a career 375 slugging uh, hitter, and I, I expect that number to drop off a little bit. However, 
I do believe the average is going to stick around the way that he's been able to hit. I mean, he's at the expected batting average near the top in the 95th percentile. His K rate is elite. He is in the top percentage in that department. His walk rate is incredibly high. Uh, I really do like the peripherals as a guy that can maybe hit around 300 to 320 even. I, I mean, this kid, he, he had all the tools coming up. Remember, he was a top prospect, as you mentioned, and he kind of fell off. But he's only 27 years old. I think that's what a lot of people seem to forget is you mentioned the pandemic. Uh, that really affected a lot of these hitters his spray chart if you look at it he's able to hit it across the board and all forms of the field um I, I really like the fact that i could see him hitting at the top of this mariners order for the foreseeable future as well i think that there's some serious keeper value here just for that and honestly i'm going to give a comp to one of his teammates how about what we saw from adam frazier a year ago before he was traded to the padres you're kind of seeing another form of Adam Frazier here in J.P. Crawford and what he offers. He's not going to hit too many home runs. Uh, don't expect the pop to necessarily be there. But I really do believe in the average here. I believe in the on-base percentage, which is nearly at 475 right now as we speak. So, yes, I think he's definitely a guy to go out and get. The fact that he's owned by 32% of fantasy owners, that doesn't shock me as much because I still think that he's a name. People are still having a hard time buying but at this point, Colby, I am buying it. And again, it's a it's a gold glove caliber glove at shortstop. He's not going to be – he's going to be in the lineup every single day, which I think is a valuable part of that, right? He's not going to get benched in two weeks if he struggles. So if you do pick him up, hold on to him for a while. See if if this you know transition into being a low strikeout guy, high walk rate guy is for real. With an, a power bump at age 27, to me, is is fathomable because guys do, you know, as they've seen more and more pitches in the big leagues, they finally find their groove. And I think he's finally finding his groove right now. I do want to move on and talk about some pitching. We've talked a lot, a lot about the hitters. I want to talk about who you want this week to stream. Yeah, and Colby and I, before this, even talked a little bit about the volatility of streaming pitchers. And uh, every week, you know that you're going to have that opportunity to do it. It's a matter of where's the risk versus the reward of it, right? Well, just kind of narrowing down to two streams this week that I'm particularly interested in. Number one, a guy that may not even be capable of being streamed in your league. He's owned by 45% in standard Yahoo leagues. That's Tony Gonsolin. But Gonsolin has really looked great in, in, I would say, his previous couple starts here. Uh, he has a true opportunity in the Dodgers rotation now, and he's going up against Arizona on Tuesday with the possibility to double dip as well later in the week against the Detroit Tigers. Another one that I have, and I'll dig more into Gonsolin in a little bit, uh, but this is a cool one right here. How about Chad Cool? 22% owned right now in Yahoo leagues. Most people probably steering clear of him, but I got to tell you, this kid has been pretty special over his first three starts of the season and his opportunity against the Cincinnati Reds. Yes, it is at home, but, but he has pitched well, even at home as well. I think that he is going to make for a very interesting stream, but let's start first with Tony Gonsolin. Uh, the opportunity of facing the Diamondbacks is something that you always have to jump on. Uh, but I'm looking at his previous start as well. And I was there when he faced the Atlanta Braves. Number one, he had a no hitter through the first five innings of that game. That's against some of the best hitting that you will face in all of baseball. So the fact that he was able to just basically masterfully go throughout that lineup was uh, something that I definitely had opening my eyes at that time. Another thing is he is really limiting the hard hit rate right now. And for the Cincinnati Reds, you know that they have very boomer bust kind of guys uh, for the most part. And uh, Sorry, I should say the Arizona Diamondbacks. They have boomer bust guys. Um, most of the time they're bust. There's a lot of strikeout. There's a lot of swing and miss. And uh, he's been getting the swing and miss quite a bit. The K rate, though, not nearly as high as you would hope. It's actually in the lower 17%. So maybe don't expect too much of that. But yet his last start is something that I think is something to go off of heading into this matchup against the team that, quite frankly, has not been hitting great so far. And when you look at it, Colby, I want to tell you this, too. Uh, I just kind of surveyed at this early part of the season and how we're doing in terms of where these lineups are and how these teams are striking out. The Diamondbacks are in that bottom 5% in terms of getting runs across the board, striking out, something we're not shocked by. Uh, but I think that this is a pretty go get them easy matchup in a ballpark where the ball doesn't fly. I think an important thing to realize, too, about this season, and, and especially as it you know applies to pitching, 
is that these pitchers had a shortened spring training. So this is now their third, their fourth start. And this is really when they would be having their opening day starts in terms of, you know, development and working up to their full workload. Now Gonsolin went six innings last time. I think he's finally at a place where he can go close to hundred pitches. They were just talking about it with Nola right on the Sunday night baseball broadcast. This would have been finally his opening day start. And now we're really starting to see pitchers shine through more, no more of this three, four inning garbage. Now is the time for a guy like Tony Gonsolin to show that he, he can own, own it in this Dodgers rotation. Cause he was a guy I was so high on coming into last season and just really couldn't get, get it going command wise. The command really hasn't been there just yet this year, but I'm going to give him another start to really show that. And I think the Diamondbacks is the perfect opportunity for that. I, I, I'm in on that one. Yeah, I, I think so too. And uh, anytime that you get the opportunity to actually stream against the Diamondbacks and plus this could be a potential double dipper, I don't see why Gonsolin's not owned today. Uh, but definitely if he is hanging around there in your free agency pool, then that's the guy to go after. But I'm going to go back to cool, uh, the cool man around the block that I think a lot of people have really been overlooking. And to be quite frank, I have been overlooking him too. It's not a guy that I had really thought of as fantasy value or somebody to own. Uh, first of all, you might be shocked. He's only 29 years old. He also spent the majority of his career out in Pittsburgh. So uh, he's now with the Rockies team that actually is winning ball games. That's something that I think a lot of us didn't expect on top of that they're getting run support you know and so that's a possibility to get wins he's not going to strike out a ton of guys however his ERA is in the actually the 90th percentile at this point we're talking about a guy also that has the expected ERA at the 84th percentile expected batting average at 88th percentile uh, I, I've liked what I've seen so far from him and the one thing that I wanted to see because this matchup that I'm talking about is at Coors Field, is how exactly is Cool going to pitch at home in a place where the ball flies? Well, pretty simply, against a team that maybe is the best he's faced offensively this year, the Philadelphia Phillies, he shut them out. He went six innings, struck out four, had a whip of .5. Yeah, he didn't strike out too many in this, but it's a quality start. It's a guy that I think could go out, get the W. Um, and to have this matchup also facing a Cincinnati Reds team that has – obviously struggled offensively. They are in that top 3% of strikeouts in the league so far. They're in the bottom three as well in runs scored. I just think that this is the perfect opportunity to get a guy that's 22% owned, maybe possibly holding on to a start from him after what he did on Sunday. I, I, I really like this matchup. Yeah, I think that's an interesting one. It's always risky picking a guy to pitch in Coors Field, but if you could double dip there, if you could get a good start out of them against, you know, a bad Reds lineup, I think you, you have to wager against a bad Reds lineup. And they combined in their last, not including today, before today, nine runs in nine games. I mean, they, they are a really, really sad, pathetic offense. I mean, Clay, Clay Snowden, our, our, our Just Baseball's own Reds, you know, fan is like, I don't even know if they're a team really at this point. And I, he might have a point. <laughs> He might have a point there. I'm going to move on to a guy that was a former Red and is now an angel, Michael Lorenzen, who was actually formerly a reliever as well. He he had two starts in 2020. He had three starts back in 2018. Now he's really kind of coming into his own as a starter this year with the Angels and dazzled in his, in his first start this season, going six innings pitch, struck out seven, giving up just two hits to the Marlins in his first start. Then he got the Astros, and obviously he's going to give up four and runs over three and two thirds, but it's the Astros. I'm not going to fault him too much for that. Everybody gets roughed up by this Astros lineup. He has crazy strikeout stuff and has limited the free passes this year. I don't know if that's necessarily sustainable, but I'm, I'm going to be excited to find out if it is, because if it is, this is a guy that, that is filthy and, and could be a guy that is not just a streamer, but a guy that has some real value to your team. I think he's worth a speck of that for his start against the Guardians. And then he's going to get the White Sox later in the week. And you might hear, wow, White Sox, I don't know, should you start him? The White Sox have not been the same lineup this year. They're without Eloy Jimenez now. It just seems like they're constantly banged up at, at all times they're not sure if Andrew Vaughn should be in their lineup or not even though he's he's probably the fourth or fifth best hitter in that lineup it's Tony La Russa who knows what he does with lineups 
but yeah, I really like Michael Lorenzen this week and, and could be a guy that you pick up and he shoves for two straight outings and people might actually want to trade for him. You never know. Yeah. I, I like that stream a lot. And I actually, I'm going to hype on the, the matchups that you had mentioned there too. So that first matchup against the guardians is the one between the two that I'm actually more hesitant with uh, just simply because the guardians somehow, believe it or not, they rank in the top five right now in hitting in major league baseball. But that is also a very small indicator. You do realize that they had that 17 run game against the lowly Royals. So not all numbers tell the whole story. They're still the Cleveland guardians. Um, I will say that white Sox matchup, as you mentioned, I really kind of eat that matchup up. Uh, not only is Eloy hurt, but also Luis Robert has had some serious issues uh, with injuries himself. At one point in time, this lineup is now having Leary Garcia hitting in the three hole. So if you're telling me that, that is somebody that Lorenzen has to go up and beat. I, I think that he can. And the way that he started out, as Colby alluded to right there, yes, he's started out incredibly well. Uh, the Astros won. I'm going to forgive that as well. I think that this is a pretty solid start uh, for a double dip. Just don't be shocked if he slips up a little bit in that first start against the Guardians because they do have something very strange and hard to explain going there. It may just be the Stephen Kwan, Jose Ramirez, and Owen Miller thing. I, it's very hard to figure out exactly what's working out there. Uh, but part of that is clearly the Cleveland recipe. But I will say that White Sox matchup, I, I really kind of dig it. And I'm normally a guy that also steers clear of the White Sox, but they are ranking uh, in among the league's worst right now. Also, numbers-wise, in strikeouts, they're – really low in runs scored. Um, I, I think that this is something that I can kind of get on board with right now. Yeah, man. I mean, I think what, what Cleveland does so well is that they don't strike out. They have the, you know, seventh lowest strikeout percentage in the league right now. And, and top to bottom, they have no easy outs. Framiel Reyes might strike out the most in that lineup. And even then he's, he's probably the second best hitter in that lineup. So they just don't strike out and there, there's not an easy out one through nine there. The last guy I'm going to touch on is Miles Michaelis, who is just one of those guys that you always find yourself picking up off waivers. At least once throughout the season, I think I pick up Michael Miles Michaelis and I go, he's turned the corner. He's finally done it. He's turned the corner. But maybe he really has turned some sort of corner this year where he looks like a pitcher that, that can at least get the job done, give you a quality start. He has a career high K rate thus far, 4% walk rate over his last four years. He's going he's gonna to provide some good whip numbers. He's faced three bad offenses so far this year and has done well with them. Brewers, Pirates, and Marlins. And this, this week he gets the Mets to start. And I think that's a lotto ticket. That's a lotto ticket. If you, can, if you need strikeouts... If you need innings pitched, okay, start him against the Mets and just pray to God he doesn't get shelled. But it's that second matchup this week that I love against the Diamondbacks that I'm all over. Because as you mentioned before, the Diamondbacks strike out a lot. They have Jake McCarthy hitting six. I don't even know who Jake McCarthy is, and he's sitting hitting six. Like, they're not a good lineup. Miles Michaelis is a veteran pitcher that knows how to get bad hitters out. He will get roughed up against good teams, but he definitely knows how to get bad teams out. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw Jake McCarthy at the uh, in and out drive through line at some point this week. Uh, yeah, no doubt. I, I really totally agree with this. You know, this is one of those almost fantasy savvy moves that you could possibly make where if you are worried about that Mets matchup, pick up Michaelis. Don't start him if you feel uncomfortable with it, with the intention that regardless of whether he does well or not, you're going to start him for that Diamondback start. Now, yes, he may take up a roster spot there. Maybe you stream somebody else before. But what if, as Colby said right there, what if he does actually pitch well against the Mets? Well, all of a sudden, you, you miss your opportunity to probably pick him up a second time because somebody else is probably scooping him up at that point. So, you know, it wouldn't hurt to get the double dip out of him, number one. I really do like that he has pitched well against the teams that he probably should pitch well against. Uh, I think this is a measuring stick against the Mets because it, it really could be, has he turned the corner? That that could be the answer is this Mets matchup. The Mets have been hitting incredibly well. It is a little bit scary to go up against one of the better hitting teams. And so if he's able to pitch accordingly with that, uh, I'm going to say if he gets a line of six innings and three runs allowed, if he gets a decent quality start, I'm in. 
You know, I, I'm totally in on this because the Mets have been uh, one of the hottest teams in baseball. And so that is my indicator that maybe he has turned the corner and he's fantasy relevant for more than a stream as well. Uh, but I will say that that Arizona Diamondbacks matchup, I'm looking at my chops at that one. Uh, that should be absolute fantasy gold. So if you don't trust him, I don't blame you because it is hard to tell early on and it's easy for over overreactions early on at this time of the year. Uh, so maybe you stash him. Maybe you sit there and say, I'm just going to be a spectator with him on my roster sitting on my bench. Maybe you go for it. Uh, one of us is going to be right in that sense. And uh, if, if that's the move, if you want to start him against the Mets, then do it. And if it works out, then, Hey, guess what? You just got a double dipper. If it doesn't work out against the Mets, hold on to him and start him against the Diamondbacks. Either way, you're going to be very thankful for that second matchup because that is a great matchup and probably the best stream overall of the week. And at the very least, you get to guy, you get to watch a guy that has a very, very cool mustache. He's yeah. got a very and cool mustache, man. Cannot go unnoticed is some good facial hair. Dusty, I thank you so much for coming on the pod this week. I feel like the listeners got crazy amount of information this week. I hope it helps them win some fantasy matchups. As always, go grab some Not Gambling Advice merch. That link is in, in the episode description. But I do want to mention before we go, Peter has been on an absolute hot streak lately. We're up 15 units on the year. Guys, go join the chalkboard link. That is our own personal group chat where we're discussing our picks, extra picks even. Peter is putting out winners after winner. I myself hit a parlay today. I'm 3-0 today. We're just, we're seeing the board super clear. So go join the chalkboard link. Dusty, thank you, man. Any words before we go? Yeah, absolutely. You know what? It is early on this season. Uh, don't make those stupid overreaction moves just yet, right? We have not even completed a full month of the season. So if you're an owner of a guy like Cattell Marte, if you're an owner of Trevor Story, don't sell low. And also, Ty France is awesome. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> Ty France may be the best hitter in baseball. And with that, <laughs> and with that, thank you, everybody.